you know, when I was 22, while I was awaiting trial for the crime, I did not commit. Uh, just after being homeless, I was living with a family of Jehovah Witnesses in a pantry with a goat, which is a whole story in itself. But while I was doing that, I was working two full-time jobs to pay for the attorney that I had to hire in order to prevent me from going to prison. Uh, so it was $25,000 for a for a 22 year old kid in 1993, which might have as well been a million dollars. So I was working two full time jobs, and one of them was I was managing a McDonald's restaurant in Brockton, Massachusetts. I was working the night shift. I would close the restaurant, and I got robbed one night at a gunpoint uh, by people who I knew had already killed uh, other people and other robberies. The police had come and warned me about them. They had actually robbed my girlfriend's McDonald's on the other side of the town a week before. And uh, unfortunately, for reasons I will never understand, I took the money that we had collected that night, you know, the, the cash, the receipts, and I had put them in a deposit bag and I was getting ready to seal that bag up when I heard the glass break and I knew what was happening. And so I dropped that bag down the chute in the back of the safe into a box that I could not open, a box that had a sign that said manager does not have key. I don't know why I did that, but I did. And um and they came back into the office and they gathered my crew people and they put us on the ground and uh, they put a gun to my head and they counted back from three and said, they'll kill me at, you know, at zero, they're going to pull the trigger if I don't open that box that I could not open. And uh, the gun was empty. They pulled the trigger and the gun was empty. And then they did it to me again. And they told me this time it was loaded. And yeah, I mean, for a very long time, I couldn't say those words. Uh, the fact that I'm able to say those words to you now is more extraordinary than you could ever imagine. It was years of uh, PTSD and now therapy that allows me to do this. But that is the moment that changes my life. Uh, lying on a greasy towel floor, knowing with certainty that I'm about to die and thinking about how I've done really nothing with my life up to that point. Uh, I understood that at the end of your life, at least for me, and I think probably for most people, uh, actually, if you look into hospice interviews, you'll see it's true. The thing people feel the most at the end of life is regret, is regret for opportunities missed, you know, girls they didn't ask out at, in high school, vacations they didn't take, children they didn't spend enough time with. And that is the only thing I felt at the end. The fear of being shot in the head was gone. The anger of what was happening to me, the beating I was taking was gone. Everything disappeared except for regret. And so, you know, when I survived that, I committed myself. I'm not really committed myself. I found myself terrified to ever feel that way again, that utter feeling of regret that I have not done everything I could with my life. And so that was the moment that changed everything for me. That was the moment then when I made the decision that being a writer and being a teacher were not pipe dreams, but were going to things I was going to relentlessly chase down until they happened. You know, so so that was when everything changed. Homework for life eight years ago just allowed me to understand how fleeting time is for us if we don't take account of it. It was the moment when I sort of discovered that. I'm just throwing my days away and I'm going to be that 90 year old guy looking back and he's going to have four stories or nine stories. You know, he's going to have 12 things to talk about. You know, those people like your, your older relatives, they tell you the same stories over and over again. It's not because they've forgotten that they told you the last time it's because they don't have anything else to say. It's because they, because they don't have a lot to say because they've just let it all go. You know, there was a moment when they had good things to say and they didn't hold on to it. And now they're 90 and they got nothing. So I don't want to be that guy. So that's what Homework for Life sort of brought to the forefront of my mind. But I was already turned around from that robbery and already, you know, on a path of constant yes and relentless pursuit of, you know, what I wanted. Whether that what I wanted is, I like to be clear, it's being a writer, being a teacher, you know, being a minister, being a DJ, but also being a great father. And being a husband who sits with his wife at night and holds her hand while she watch it, while we watch television together, you know, you know, it's those things too. So while I say I'm relentless in my pursuit of my goals, my goals also include spending 20 minutes with my cat today. I'm going to make sure that I spend 20 minutes with my cat on my lap because that makes me feel good. It makes my cat feel good. And someday my cat's not going to be here and I'm going to be happy that I gave my cat at least 20 minutes a day of love, you know? So, so that's what I talk about in terms of goals. I don't like people to misconstrue the idea of success with 
career success. It can be whatever you want it to be and whatever you need it to be. Mm-hmm.